Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this F-Track webinar, Animation Trends in 2021. Uh, my name is Ray Cuevas, and I am the Art Manager at Mountaintop Studios. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about upcoming trends in animation for 2021. Um, animation uh, has always been pretty popular uh, ever since the first animated short, right, Phantasmagory, created by Emil Cole in the 1900s. Uh, animation as a medium has kept evolving over time. And in recent years, we've had a, a slew of new tools and innovations that have become available to animators and CG artists that makes this a really exciting time to be working in the field. That's why I'm pretty stoked to be hosting today's panel. Uh, we have uh, uh, some amazing speakers here today. Uh, and so in a few moments, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Uh, there are four creatives who have worked on animated projects ranging from popular feature films to TV series, advertisements, and award-winning short films. Um, over the next 90 minutes, they will explore upcoming animation trends, shedding light on 3D, 2D animation workflows, the creative process, and more. Uh, it's going to be a great, a great discussion today. I'm super excited. We're going to dive in and say hello to them right now um, in just a second. But before we begin, however, I would like to cover just a, a few quick things about the webinar setup today. Uh, the runtime is going to be 90 minutes, so we're going to end at 12.30 p.m. This chat function uh, will be on and open throughout the webinar. So if you have any questions, please fire away. We'll have about 10 minutes uh, at the end where we'll post some of the questions uh, or the most popular questions to our speakers. So please don't be shy. I highly encourage you to uh, submit those questions. Uh, and then finally, uh, the webinar will be recorded and shared with all attendees. Um, so we'll send that link to you once it's available. And that's it. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our three speakers today. Uh, first up, we have Hank uh, Driscoll, head of CG at Cinesite. Hey everyone. Hank, welcome. Can you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. I was a, I uh, was at Disney Animation for 20 years uh, as part of the studio leadership there and supervising films. I did a two and a half year stint at Blue Sky Studios as their CTO. And most recently, I've become the global head of CG for Cinecide Animation. Awesome. Really great to have you here. Next up, we have Jeff Lopez, co-head of CG at The Mill. Hello guys, how are you? I'm Jeff Lopez. Let me just begin by saying I'm sorry and apologize if you guys hear construction in the background. Uh, don't mind that. Um, I've been at the mill for about 11 years. Uh, just recently, I was uh, now given the liberty to get to be co-head of the department with my friend Kevin Ives. And I've been doing this for about 23 years and I've worked with several other studios, RGA, Saya, Nathan Love, to name a few. Um, and I'm excited to be in this conversation with all of you guys. Awesome, thanks for being here, Jeff. Um, next up, we have uh, Roland Gauthier, the executive producer and partner at Hinge Digital. Hi there, um, I'm Roland Gauthier. I'm in Portland, Oregon, and have been uh, the one of the partners at Hinge for the last 12 years. Before that, we were, my two partners and I all met at Leica here in Portland and have been in the film and uh, advertising industries for better part of 20 plus years. So really excited to be part of this and have this conversation. Awesome, thank you for being here. And last but not least, we have Bruce Knapp, who's a line producer at Late Night Cartoons. And um, there you go. So yes, uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> um, I've worked in animation for what seems like a really long time. First uh, as editor on animated commercials, and then I made the jump to series animation. Uh, first as editor, then production manager, line producer. Uh, I've worked for shows, uh, worked on shows for Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, Disney, and most recently on our Cartoon Network for Showtime. Very awesome. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm super excited about the conversation uh, that we're gonna be having. Um, I think that this year, uh, well, this year and the last year, right, have been uh, pretty challenging for everybody. Um, but at the same time, there's been some pretty amazing things uh, that have happened uh, in the world of entertainment and I think in the world of CG and animation uh, specifically. So I'm excited to kind of cover some of those things today. Um, you know, the first topic that I have here that I wanted to talk about is, uh, is real-time animation, which I think has been kind of making a splash recently. Uh, we've seen some really awesome uh, shows employing the technology. 
Um, so I'm really interested in just hearing uh, what your thoughts are on real-time animation and how do you think this technology is going to uh, you know, disrupt or you know, improve the work that uh, people are doing um, you know, nowadays in the field? Who, whoever else take this one first. In? Yep, absolutely, please. Okay, so I mean, with me, I can tell you, like, I'm, I'm very, I'm an optimist. I'm optimistic about this new endeavor. I'm, I'm excited to tackle it. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I, I believe, and I understand what people would feel something negative about it. Um, just like what two D animators felt when three D came about, you know, they feel like their jobs is going to be gone, but it ended up being another, another art form. So I feel like the same thing is going to be happening with Unreal, and I'm excited. You know, like, uh, um. The capabilities are, are still not quite there, I think, but then, you know, we're doing virtual um, characters with uh, mocap going into Unreal right away. Same thing with facial. Now that Unreal came out with their meta humans, I think that's it's yeah. amazing. They have 669 shapes, which is going to create, right now the arcade only has the 52. So imagine the, the, the amplitude is going to look so much better. So again, I'm an optimist and I feel like this is exciting moving forward. That's my two cents on it. <laughs> Certainly, for for me, when thinking about real time, uh, real time technologies have had a place in animated film production for a number of years now. Uh, everywhere from the front end of the pipeline, in scouting out environments, uh, figuring out where where you, the cinematography is going to begin on a given sequence, uh, all the way through to real time ray tracing in the viewport for lighter interac interaction and a lot of it's about capturing the vision of the director. Uh, when we do our jobs right, we're taking the director's vision of this is the film I want to make. And the director and the story team are iterating on that as many times as possible. Uh, because each time they turn the crank on that, it improves the quality of the film. And that's the real goal is we're trying to create a product that means something to the world. Uh, the best we can do to help that is to make it so that the active shot production doesn't take so long mm -hmm. that it's infringing on the ability to turn the crank on story. So if you can create any kind of technology that makes an artist able to iterate more quickly, they can get ideas in front of the director, get feedback and, and re, you know, iterate on that loop a number of times in fewer calendar weeks, which means in the story process, which takes a given amount of time to turn the crank on, might get one more turn of the crank. And that means the quality of the stories are gonna improve. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also really exciting to see, you know, it's the, the whether it's driven by video capture or motion capture, seeing how we're able to use that both for 2D and 3D animation. You know, I know obviously for a lot of the kind of the 2D shows that's starting to be become a, a, a really great opportunity to get more interactive um, you know, performances, potentially kind of extend the role of voice talent into actually performing too, which is pretty cool. And um, it's, uh, you know, it, I feel like it also bridges the gaps between what directors and, you know, production folks are used to seeing in a live action Kind of setting where they it's kind of what you see is what you get and they can they can have lots of kicks of can at that performance and get some of those little nuances that you not, might not be able to get if you know as as hank said you're really focused on we just need to push this through and we only get you know a few limited kicks of the can and just get it done so yeah i think that's pretty exciting absolutely bruce uh, interestingly, our show cartoon, um, our cartoon president started from a real-time animation um, to origin, and we, and it, it was basically, you sort of need like a library of actions that character animator would call up. So we would, at one point, there would be a voice um, actor, but also a puppeteer kind of running the puppet. So you got lip sync from the actor's performance, and then you actually you got the body motion from somebody triggering actions. Um, we wanted a very quick pipeline, but we also realized that you, you kind of want the hand of the artist to finesse all of these things. So 
we kind of had character animator as real-time animation as a foundation, but then quickly moved away from that so that we would use aspects of it, but then we would always send it through a pipeline, basically almost like post in a sense, but to finesse the lip sync and then add more actions. So it wasn't, we, we as, a, as um, a series didn't want to rely on it because we kind of had one shot at it. So we, we basically did sort of a half step back towards traditional where it's kind of a combination of both. And we use character animator, but we use it somewhat differently so that we get kind of the best of both. That's really interesting. You know, I think, um, you know, Jeff, you mentioned uh, metahumans. Uh, I think Epic in general with Unreal Engine, for example, has been making a lot of moves towards, uh, you know, kind of expanding the usability of the engine. Uh, obviously we've, we've seen series like The Mandalorian uh, now, you know, using the technology to great effect. Um, so Jeff, you mentioned that you were optimistic. Uh, about the about the use of the technology. So, do you think you know as the technology evolves, as we get more and more tools being developed for uh, game engines, um, do you guys think that we will be seeing uh, more of this uh, uh, technology just be used across uh, across the field? Hell yeah, of course. I, I think that um, I mean, I was super excited when I saw it. It came out of left field for me. I was like, wait, I yeah. didn't expect this. Um, so, and, you know, and I didn't hear anything about it before. So I get this was like, a, they kept the hush hush, which was great. But I, I, I mean, I, I would love to see this more into let's who knows, it will go to creatures. Now you can involve and you can probably create this into a creature like, you know, a Mandalorian guy talking with the same facial features, but it's just some some weird guy. So again, I, I can see it as being, they're developing some really cool tools. I'm, I'm excited about their animation stuff that they have. They have some AI going with it. it I mean, it's, a, again, the extra tools that we're going to add it, and it's just an expensive brush. But at the end of the day, it's going to be the artist who's going to make it look great. Yeah. That's pretty plain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, all of it's in service of crafting the story you're being asked to make. And I mean, some of these things, you know, they showcase what they're delivering in real time. And real time in and of itself isn't as important in the final deliverable you know when you're crafting a movie uh it's really the it's an order of magnitude leap in the quality of what you can produce in a given amount of time mm -hmm. and so if it takes if you're throwing so much stuff into the scene that it's taking five seconds to generate a frame darn you know if that <laughs> yeah. stuff that yeah. used to take five hours to render on a farm uh, five seconds of frame is perfectly reasonable when your yeah. end goal is delivering contiguous frames for 90 minutes of animated story. I think it's also really exciting to see it, those technologies being used across a really broad range of projects. You know, it's not just, we're not using it only for the larger shows or the feature films, um, but bringing it to you know, uh, independent films and commercials and, you know, a range of different ways and timelines and scopes um, that actually make it feasible for people to express themselves using those tools creatively. So I think that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, we were just working on a, on a uh, mocap um, music video that was with a, a dancer. And in the end, you know, we, we shot all of that in our studio uh, one of the few times we've been in our studio for the last like year, <laughs> but um, shot it there. And then um, seeing that, that motion and all of that performance being brought into this really kind of handcrafted, almost stop motion world, but all done in Unreal. It's like a totally different, you know, kind of flavor of, of look and styles, but it's really exciting to be able to bring that kind of thing. So, you know, something is, I mean, honestly, as generally not particularly well-funded as uh, music videos. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Bruce, anything to add? Um, I think also with the real-time aspect of things, um, we're also, we have a sister program, uh, Tuning Out the News, that uses it even more so than our parking president. And the idea is that you could almost do like a daily news program with it and design the characters so that they work with the, with the program and they work with the 
with real time so that it does not require or call for or depend on fuller animation. And so um, some of this is a little of fitting the, the content to what the software can offer. And so I, I think it's a little bit of that as well as sort of meeting in the middle as far as like what you, if the most important thing is that you can actually get something out every day, then you decide what it is that you need to see in order for that daily turnaround to look satisfying. So that's the other side of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, another, uh, another big trend kind of, you know, moving on from the real time stuff, uh, is, uh, the kind of blending of 2d and 3d. Um, I think, you know, there, there's been, you know, shows that have, that have done it, uh, obviously kind of automatically the thing that pops to mind for me is, you know, Spider-Verse doing it, you know, using keyframes, right. Um, I think that was a that's a pretty big one uh, that kind of brought that conversation to the forefront. I think Love Death Robots uh, that uh, the Witness short as well. Uh, that's all you know, all about Tommy uh, and kind of his style. But uh, I'm curious uh, if you guys uh, you know are you know kind of what you what your thoughts are on this approach to animation uh, and if it's just something that your your studios are, are interested in trying out. I mean, I'll, I'll start this one. I, I would add Feast to the mix, for instance. Sure. The yeah. short that was done at Disney Animation with a very painterly yeah. look. Uh, really, I mean, to some extent, certainly in animated feature film production, 2D sensibilities have always been there. Mm -hmm. You know, in the caricaturing of designs of the characters and in the environments uh, to the exaggerated motions, you know, the squash and stretch kind of sensibilities to the way the characters move, caricatured, uh, motion and characters and environments have always been a part of, of CG animation. I think really what you're touching on is more non-photorealistic rendering. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the final look of the film being something other than, you know, in the worst case, CG plastic. And uh, I, th I think we're all, as an industry, excited about that. You know, it has challenges and there's a lot of great uh, approaches and technologies being applied to it. Um, we're, we're exploring it on like half the projects we're working on, absolutely, to varying degrees, uh, because I think Spider-Verse opened up to more people that notion of, oh, it doesn't have to look like that to be CG. What, well, right. then what if it looks like this? And, and it's created a bunch of conversations about different kinds of looks. You know, Spider-Verse very deliberately was going for a comic booky kind of feel to the look. Mm -hmm. And that's great. That is not at all the same look for different kinds of projects but breaking away from kind of CG classic into these wider palette of looks is important, I think, to the whole industry. Would you say that you can probably include the list is Claws? Would you say Claws would be one movie that was, uh, was a mixture sure. of 2D and 3D, which it was, when you first looked at it, it looked 2D. Right. And in my mind, I'm like, but that looks so 3D, but it was so well done that I'm like, and it, you know, you know, for for a couple of minutes, I kind of thought about it, but then I kind of engaged in the story, and I love the story. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen it a number of times, like at least four times already, because I enjoy the story of it, and um, and the the fact how uh, I've seen the making of it, where they have three D objects being, you know, uh, animated in three D, but it's being a two D effect, like the, the main characters, and it's so well, so so well, really well integrated, which to me that is like. That's what's making all these things together blend in really well. I think these are, you know, Spy Spiderverse, uh, uh, Claws, a uh, great, great example of that. So just imagine what would happen once you start incorporating Unreal into that, to that aspect of sure. it. Sure. It's gonna be an amazing thing. I think really you go back to Great Mouse Detective and you go back to, you know, in the 2D film days, they started incorporating CG elements in a way that they weren't obtrusive. You know, they started mm -hmm. making CG elements fit into a 2D look and paradigm all the way through to the deep canvas explorations with Tarzan and Atlantis. Uh, I think that notion has always been there. And then the pendulum sort of swung towards CG and the CG look and, and audiences embracing that. And so therefore movies started delivering to that. Now we're starting to say, hey, wait, we can do more than just that. We can make films with a wide variety of looks. Yeah. Yeah, we've even within the, the 2D world, <clears throat> there are times when you realize that you don't really want to draw 
like a Jeep rotating as it drives by you. And so we'll use 3D models and then either tune shaded or actually just use them as after effect um, basis so that we can get it to, it stays within a 2D look, but mm -hmm. it doesn't, but you don't have to like, doesn't have the labor intensive action of actually creating it. And I think right. part of it, which is consistent with what you've been saying is that it is that it doesn't shout like, oh, there's a CG model, like it, it all blends right. into it. And you're just impressed by how that action happened without really calling attention to how it was done, just that it worked really well. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we've also seen a lot of that blending between stop motion and CG over the years. You know, either the pendulum swing both ways with stop motion wanting to look like super smooth CG and CG wanting to look like handcrafted, you know, fingerprints in the clay stop motion. And um, I think it's, you know, we're, we're looking at Chicken Little and, you know, all the kind of smearing actions that they were trying to bring into the movements of that to make it feel like traditional 2D motion as well. So I think there's, it, you know, it's, it's all about creating a style, what that vision is, and then finding the right combination of tools, as you were saying, Bruce, to get the job done, get it to look really good and to, you know, execute on that vision. So I think that's that all, all, of, a, all of our different kind of forebears and future artists are, are gonna learn from each other. And, and I do think there was a, there was, I'm sorry, I mean to cut you off, but uh, there was, was a point, I remember when CG was sort of finding its footing, this is early, this is like early 2000s, where people would be like, well, that's it for stop motion, why would you need stop motion? Right. And then, yeah. then there was a, an acknowledgement, oh, you know what, <laughs> let's keep all of these things and just use them as, as their best use and not right. have one look like the other. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And in some so cases, I think. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Roland, please. I was just going to say sometimes it's also a matter of kind of time for the production and you want to get a stop motion feel, but you need the flexibility of doing it in CG to get the, you know, to not have a linear just, you know, shoot every frame and hope you don't have to do reshoots. So, you know, I think that's, that's, uh, it's that flexibility is great. Absolutely. And I think you see, you see studios using that to great advantage too, you know, obviously Leica, right. They, they have their own look and they are, you know, committed to stop motion, uh, to, to stop motion in general, but they are using VFX to, to, in, you know, and see animation to great effect in their movies and to speed up their process and, and all sorts oh. of things. So I think, you know, it, it just benefits the end product a lot more. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Sorry, yeah, like in Cuba, for example, right? In Cuba, mm -hmm. they did all the, the particle effects were just done in, uh, in I, I don't know, some Houdini, I'm not sure. Uh, but then you know, the characters were all in, you know, in, uh, in traditional, traditional stop motion. Though they do use a lot of rapid prototyping up front to actually sculpt and develop all the faces. And then they shoot mm -hmm. those in stop motion. So it's like this very kind of big yeah, right. cycle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a lot of previs too. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, a friend of mine told me when he worked that he was actually creating the blend shapes. He would yeah. animate the lip sync and the blend yeah. shapes, and then he yeah. would export it out to the 3D printer. And the yeah. next day, they would get all the prints for the approved yeah. facial Paint stuff. and polish and yeah, all that. Right. Yeah. It, was, it yeah. was a great yeah. way to utilizing all these different mediums. And, and the, the, you know, the, the end result is really, really astonishing. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, another another trend that I've seen recently, or I think just people are starting to experiment with it, is you know obviously also the use of AI um, to uh, to get that two D look. Uh, I saw a couple of I don't remember exactly where on Twitter, but I saw somebody doing a test with creating a little three D animation and then just drawing two keyframes and then feeding the two keyframes to 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 AI and then having it generate the the rest of the frames, the rest of the in betweens uh, to get that that 3D animation to look basically like it was hand-drawn. Um, I, think, I think style transfer is exciting. Yeah, absolutely. That's that notion of giving it exemplars of what you want the thing to look like and then and and some good keys as to how to apply it and then having it apply it in the in-betweens has some really you know promising future as well. But it's all in service of whatever the vision is of what the thing is supposed to look like. And mm -hmm. anything that broadens our palette of tools to hit a look is, is a win. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, like we like we were just talking about just now with, you know, the, the whole death of uh, stop motion, you know, the, those kind of naysayers uh, way back when. Um, I think, again, yeah, it's all in service of the, of the end product. And, you know, and I think Leica was just a great example of that, using all the tools for in service and going through this, all these motions just in service of the final product and the final look. Right. I think I think that will, you know, artists will obviously, of course, always be needed um, throughout the entire process. Um, so uh, I'm interested in moving on to uh, just kind of talking about, uh, you know, animation, uh, you know, kind of styles like realism versus non-realism, for example. Uh, I'm interested in kind of getting your thoughts on, the, on here, uh, you know, kind of what's, what are you seeing, uh, you know, with your projects? Where are you, your company's leaning towards right now, um, you know, in terms of, of those two areas? I mean, certainly we, because we're doing both visual effects work and animation work, uh, the visual effects side is often driven as, you know, by something that needs to fit into a live action paradigm in some way, shape or form. Uh, so it often tends towards the realistic mm -hmm. in animation because it's a completely synthetic realized world. You get to, from the beginning, strike out and find an art direction and a style for your characters and environments that are unique to that particular story. And so they're almost always caricatured. Uh, very rarely are they realistic because if you, especially if you drove towards human characters that move realistically, are proportioned realistically and live in a realistic looking world, it starts to beg the question, well then why are you animating it? Why aren't you just putting a camera on some actors? Mm -hmm. um, part of the fun of animation is you literally get to create an entirely new world with its own laws of physics you know, and, and tell a story in that. That's part of the fun. Um, right. So they're very rarely too realistic. You know, sometimes some facet of it will be realistic, like light transport. You know, it'll be a fairly real, realized looking materials, fairly photoreal in the, in the way the scenes look, but it's still caricatured motion and caricatured designs. Um, and other times it's completely something different, mm -hmm. so. I think it's interesting to see, you know, also the use of deep fake technology being kind of either used for production, like uh, the Sassy Justice show, which is kind of hilarious, but um, also being used after the fact by, um, you know, either uh, semi-professional professional folks independently to kind of rework shots that they didn't think worked all that well on, you know, a show or, or a feature to get you know more realistic results it's kind of interesting to see how that you know that pendulum is swing as well yeah um oh go ahead bruce we um <clears throat> for our shows we've been for cartoon president for sure we've been mostly caricaturing uh government officials uh and so it stayed I'm not even sure where you would if you say that 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 that's more or less realistic or it's not it's not, you know, Adventure Time or SpongeBob, so it's not mm -hmm. cartoony in that sense, but it's more like Archer or, you know, that that's sort of somewhat more realistic, but still with people able to do things uh, that normal humans wouldn't do. And of course we have the physical similarities uh, to real people. Um, and I, I think generally that's, our, our look is a little bit more like that, although it could change with the next project, but so far it's been a, a tick more on the realistic side. Absolutely. For, 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 us, for us as at the mill, for example, I can let you know that we pretty much do everything. We're a commercial house, so we do everything on the spectrum. So we do either animals or we do, uh, you know, human characters. So the, it, it, we kind of cover the range. So like lately we've been doing a lot of the apex jobs um, and which are kind of like a hybrid between real and not real because it lives in this sort of gaming world. So um, with this new technology, I, you know, I think we, they're probably gonna, clients are probably gonna go more to be like, we wanna do that meta humans. We want it to look more real, but again, we'll just veer to what, you know, the clients would want to, to do, or who knows if they would wanna do animals with that sort of sensibility of realism. So, you know, we'll, Definitely. we'll, we'll take whatever the client wants. <laughs> <laughs> of course um and roland you actually you mentioned uh deepfake technology 
Um, I'm curious, is that something that uh, that your you guys' studios are, are, are exploring or using currently uh, in production? Um, we, we're certainly, we've been looking at it and starting to do our tests. The interesting thing is that, you know, it does have some very specific requirements about mm -hmm. kind of the source material you need to do that effectively. And obviously also just some very demanding <laughs> requirements on, on the hardware um, and the time that it needs to, you know, kind of learn on the AI side. So, um, I, you know, we've looked at it, at using it, using a more deep fake approach or more kind of just traditional facial replacement approach on, you know, real people um, with, you know, CG face masks for either de-aging or changing one person to another or other things like that. So yeah, it's, it's still, I think the verdict's out in terms of how, how, um, how easy it's going to be within just like real, uh, you know, off the shelf tools. I don't know that we've gotten there yet. I, I feel the same way. We just recently did a job for replacing uh, Bob Ross's head in one of the commercials and we use uh, deep fake, but it was kind of like we use, uh, so it started with like, a, you know, actor, you know, actor kind of looks like the guy, then maybe prosthetics and then deep fake on top of it and then enhance it. So it's, I don't think it's quite there yet. You're right. It, it takes a lot of, you need good, um, good video reference. And also your back end, you need to have a lot of AI, thousands of thousands of hours on it. So I, I think it's a little bit in the infancy, I think, uh, you know, sure. uh, unless you have a team of MITs to be in your backyard that can help you on that. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, we're, we're, we're nabbing at it. We're, we're trying to see what we can use it in our, in our commercials that come up, but mm -hmm. it, it does come up a lot. Wow. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Hank, Cinecide is, is Cinecide X something that is Deepfix something that you're exploring? Uh, if they are, it hasn't come up in any meetings I've been in, but <laughs> that doesn't mean they're not doing it on the visual sure. tech side. Certainly, I mean, and it was touched on things like, you know, face replacement for stunt actors, things like that. There, there's some potential there. Um, on the animation film side, no, we're not, not looking really. at yeah. for that. Uh, my primary exposure to deepfake most days is watching the same YouTube channels he was referring to of watching people go, that sucked, I could do better and find <laughs> yeah. deepfake to, to work that others have done. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, veering back towards more uh, kind of animation uh, related talk here. Um, you know, something that, that we've been talking about a lot, uh, you know, as, as we've discussed uh, these technologies that, that, that we're all interested in, uh, is storytelling, right? I mean, uh, storytelling is king, as, yeah, as the saying goes, uh, very famous words, right? Uh, I'm interested uh, to, to hear from you guys how you think that storytelling is changing um, in animation, if at all, given all of the kind of recent developments in technology um, that we have available now. I mean, I touched on a bit earlier, the biggest thing that I've seen is all of the advances in asset production and shot production enabling more turns of the crank on the story. I think, sure. and I think we're seeing that across the industry. I think the quality of the stories is improving mm -hmm. uh, within a given budget, within a given time frame, we're, we're hitting a higher bar than we were, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, so I think that's the significant component to that. Not so much that the technology itself changed in storytelling, although I've seen places where they've taken stabs at that. Uh, on the animated film side, it's still boiling down to drawing boards, putting them together sequentially, uh, recording temp dialogue with crew members to, to, mm -hmm. you know, to sit in until you've hired your actors and putting it up on reels, putting it in front of a group of people and seeing how they react and then turning that crank as many times as you can get away with till somebody who's paying the bill says, stop it already. Uh, this is going out the door. Um, that process has been the way animated films have been made since Disney first started uh, in the you know, 20s and 30s. And, and uh, it's, it works. You know, it, it, that iterative process is a really powerful way to, to find a story that's worth telling. So um, technologies on that component haven't really changed that process that much. 
I, I think I did on what uh, Hank just said about that. Re, you know, the more the more iterations you have, the better it's going to look. So right now, our directors, our in-house directors, are loving it, where we get to use Unreal and we get to they get to see their final product really early in a, in in the in, in the process where yeah. they, they don't have to wait. They don't have to see grayscale characters anymore or cars. They see it fully lit with reflections and it looks amazing. So for yeah. them, they're like, okay, that's it. I'm not going back to grayscale previous now. We're going to go full on, you know, on real, uh, which is great. I mean, there's limitations right now. Depth of field is not that great. Motion blur is still not that great, but it gets you there really quick. And like mm -hmm. Hank says, the more processes that you're going to look at the end, I think with storytelling, you, it's going to get, uh, um, you know, uh, faster, better, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I think that's going to be in all in our aspect, all the commercials that we do. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can I, I, uh, uh, go go ahead. ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll make it quick. Um, I, I think for us, in, in in really in an echo of what you've been saying, what everybody's been saying so far is that the the fact that you can make revisions so much quicker, you can review, revise, turn around much quicker, means you can number one hone the story that you started out trying to make. But also, if you find a fork in the road and decide to go a little different direction, maybe you can you can actually do that because the whole process can be done quicker. And so maybe you don't get as many iterations if you change things more on a larger scale, but at least you can make those changes. And the story in that way is more of the story that you want to make when you get in the middle. And therefore, possibly it's a better story because you've seen more of the whole piece as opposed to kind of being like, well, you know, <laughs> we storyboarded it this way. So this is what's going, you know, this is the way it's going to go out. So sure. it, it is yeah. that it's the sort of evolutionary, the more generations you can get done, the, the more the sort of Darwinian effect of whatever your story is actually winds up being what you ultimately would prefer it to be at the end. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And I think what, uh, you know, all of, all of you were saying too, you know, particularly on the commercial side, I feel like you're getting a better continuity of storytelling between, you know, particularly if it's a, a project that involves live action on the front end and, you know, traditionally go to post on the back end, you get to, you know, with things, tools like virtual production and seeing, you know, instead of just staring at green screen, you know, dots and all that stuff, you're actually getting to see environments, you're getting, you know, uh, talent to actually see you know, on the screens around them, where they are, what they're reacting to, instead of looking at a tennis ball or whatever those things, you know, or traditional uh, post tropes would be. Um, I think it's just, it's really exciting to see that a, a live action director who might be leading the front end of the storytelling actually gets to interact directly with all the people who are gonna be doing all that work that would traditionally be at the back end and actually get to work together and plan things and, you know, make decisions up front and actually have that that continuity be a lot more connected than just kind of that well you know we'll fix it in post or well they'll have to figure that out later what is that going to look like I don't know you know we'll see all of that stuff is just I think there's there's just a lot more uh, we can get better stories as a result because we're, it's not that kind of disconnected disjointed thing that we've had in the past. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, overall, you, you would say you know that uh, you know technology is not necessarily uh, you know kind of driving animation. It's it, obviously storytelling is still kind of the uh, the the king, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, uh, which is, you know, I, I think it's interesting. Are you guys seeing that uh, that because these technologies are changing and these kind of workflows now are emerging, where we're able, like you were saying, to work with kind of a, a, a people on both ends of that uh, of the pipeline? Uh, are you finding that that you know your deadlines are becoming shorter or, or coming up quicker? Uh, are you adjusting the time frame, for example, that it takes to produce something, or are you just seeing that now you just have the ability to, like you were saying, kind of go through the the you know one more crank of the wheel uh, like hank was saying um and uh and maybe just are able to spend a little bit more time crafting something that you know that one's an interesting one and i see both sides to the extremes on that on the one hand uh, certainly in the world we find ourselves in you know people are questioning what is the long-term viability of theatrical mm -hmm. you know or are 
or does streaming become our primary platform for delivery for animated projects? And uh, just the price point of those are very different. And uh, so that's a place where you, you'd start wanting to capture these efficiency gains as savings uh, mm -hmm. to try and keep those price points down to a point where it becomes very appealing if streaming is your delivery platform. On the other hand, I've had, I, I've had great conversations with finance folks over the years uh, specifically about new technologies where, they, where they've said exactly that. They've said, we've introduced this new technology. It's made this department twice as fast. Why are we not seeing that in savings? And it's because as soon as a new technology comes along, it gets consumed immediately in, in a scope and scale and spectacle and or turns of the crank. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, 25 years ago, I was hearing that you know, video game technology was going to overtake film production, and that still has not come to pass. It, those kinds of technologies have a place and they're really useful, but at the end of the day, it will take a night to render a scene. Right. But they will, because the artist will want to leave at the end of the day, having launched that onto the farm and the next morning they want it ready for reviews. If it's rendering faster than that, they'll throw more stuff in the scene. You know, and I don't mean that's even conscious necessarily, but if, if it gives them the opportunity to raise the bar on the art they're creating, they will consume as much of that as they're allowed to. And I think the, the move from theatrical towards streaming is the biggest thing that's gonna push back against that and actually drive to lower price points. I couldn't agree with you more on that. I think the, the, timeline, the timeline to get jobs done right now, it is getting smaller. So you, you know, we have to utilize every, every trick that we can to make it uh, look, still look good. It's affordable, it's something we can deliver in time. So, um, you know, lost my train of thought. <laughs> but, but, you know, basically it's like, you know, the more time the director, like you said, like, because we can do it so much quicker, the director, we can, you know, there's times where I can, I, I would animate until the very next day before it delivers just because they could do it. Uh, so even though you, did, you do have the chance to be able to do it half, do it faster, it sometimes it's not necessarily the best thing to do. So I think it's like a balanced act to make sure you can get the best out of it instead of like I'm completely squeezing it. And, and at the end, you're just like exploring stuff that you already know the first version or the second version that you did is actually the one that's going to go. You don't have to go 10 or 20 versions later. It's just, uh, you know, I think a waste of energy in my, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, I usually on the the uh, series that I would work on the animation initially the animation was sent overseas, um, and it would traditionally from the time the writers started writing one episode to when we actually were able to deliver that episode was a year, and then we would stagger it every week they were starting another script and so eventually every every week we'd be delivering a, another show. When we we moved that in house. It still wound up taking a year. Um, a lot of the you know longer script times and on all sort of ate up the whatever savings that would have been between you know having the communication in house. So still a year. But then when we uh, started working with character animator, really put pressure on character animator and After Effects. We recorded, decided to record everything in house. Like all everything was done in house. We actually went from the fifty two week turnaround to 17 weeks. So we could then do stories that were topical. And although things would change over that time period, they were pretty, pretty good. And then we would very quickly, we could add like a two minute, like a cold open to each show before it delivered it, which was up to the minute. Like that is something that, that really just happened earlier in the week. And mm -hmm. So the whole timeline got shrunk, but then we were able to add this thing on at the end that we would, never would have been able to, to do before. And it was a combination of software, but also just the sort of mandate that everything be compressed, done on site. So there was never any waiting for studio time for anything. Yeah, it's, it's you know, very interesting. So, you know, there's, I, I, you know, arguments on, on both sides there, uh, I think a little bit. Um, you know, I think technology, right, as as a as a as a whole, has, has opened up so many doors. 
and uh, I think Hank, the argument that what you were saying is funny about uh, you know, the, the uh, like why can't why can't it be faster, right? And I think you just can't rush that uh, that creative process either. Um, so, you know, in terms of in terms of the title of this webinar, right? Trends, uh, uh, you know, in animation, we've kind of covered real time, we've covered two D and three D blending. Uh, I'm interested to hear from you guys uh, if there are any other uh, trends. Uh, that you are, you know, kind of seeing uh, emerge in the industry, uh, or that you know you yourselves are looking forward to, um, you know, kind of in the in the next kind of few years. Uh, yeah, I'm interested to, to kind of just hear your thoughts if there's anything else that we that we haven't covered uh, in that regard. Um, there was a couple of papers that were that I remember seeing it uh, as of lately. There have come up brought up to me uh, work, which is I think we mentioned it already, but it was like. How do you take a pre-existing animation and AI so you can apply it to some to another character? So for example, I could um, have a, two, a 2D approach. So let's say if you AI, I don't know, um, Pinocchio or something like that, and then you apply that animation to another character like uh, Pillsbury Doughboy. And then okay. it will be the same at blend. So there's, there's been some SIGGRAPH uh, papers about how do you implement AI traditional animation into another character. And um, it's come up and maybe that's something that people are, are experimenting on it. I don't know how you will make it a thing, but I don't know, I, I, that's something that came up to me that just that I, I, I stumble across. Interesting, so so you're saying taking uh, like a, like a, like a, a 2D, animation like drawn animation and then applying it what to a still frame and then capturing using that animation to, to, to you can apply to like a like a 3d 3d character okay you know like you know how it is where you can so it's, it's, it's like the same technology as if you take um, um you know right now you can take uh live action uh, 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 live action animation live action shoot and apply it to a character kind of like a mocap so it, it's mm. smart enough to, to recognize where the limbs are. And if it turns around, it would know, it would predetermine what happens to those limbs and is able to apply it to a 3D character. So the same thing you can do, the same thing now for a 2D approach and then apply it to a 3D character. So it, it opens up like, like what's gonna happen when you do squash and stretch, how is that being applied to a 3D character? Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to see what's gonna happen with that. I've, have you guys, any of them heard, heard of you this, about this stuff? Yeah, a few, a few of those. Yeah, and I, I know the, I'm trying to remember what the name of that, there's at least two or three uh, YouTube channels that, you know, they're always looking at the latest papers and how AI is being used or, or those uh, machine learning. Um, I'm, you know, I've seen ones where they're looking at, you know, bringing uh, like either stop motion or other traditional or older animations and using, you know, uh, uh, AI processing to then like up res them or smooth, you know, bring them up to like 60 frames, a, uh, you know, 60 frames a second or other things like that to, you know, I guess in some ways give those, those older mediums or, or other mediums a little bit more longevity on our newer monitors and, and all that, which I think is pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, there's, I, I, I think we're getting more and more of those kind of the theoretical or, or kind of, uh, the, the papers are, I think, at a much rap, more rapid pace kind of coming out as practical tools um, that people are getting to try and use. And it's neat to be able to, to experiment with those and, and use them on projects. Uh, for me, I just two that came to mind right off the bat. One, uh, there's actually a question for us, so I'll, I'll touch on it later in more detail, but uh, moving towards more parallel workflows is a big one. Uh, over the next several years that I think is going to really big, be big. Uh, there's still too much of kind of the old traditional waterfall model mm -hmm. built into production practices and moving towards real parallelization between artists, I think is going to be a big deal. Another that I'm excited by is uh, we talk about real-time technologies in previs and the ability to for the director to see environments and things like that. We talk about real-time and its impact on the rendering process and different kinds of advances there that are making our, changing our ability to create imagery. One of the ones I'm really excited by is the explorations into real-time puppeteering and real-time 
interaction with the CG character, new kinds of tools and technologies for animators themselves to deliver performances. Because that's, that's something that hasn't really evolved in significant ways since Norm, Norm Badler invented reach hierarchy and IK systems in the 80s. Uh, there's so much room there to invent whole new technologies for the animators to deliver a performance. I think there's gonna be a lot of cool efforts in that, in that arena in the coming years. Definitely. And, you know, um, Bruce, do you, do you have anything to add before we go to the next question? No, I can only, I mean, I, I, I can only more generally recap that it seems like there's it, it's there's going to be fewer steps that that fewer people can do so it's all it would basically more more of the animation process can be done by fewer people quicker mm -hmm. <laughs> so sure. basically i mean because it was you know initially from the jump it was a long process and i i think that there's more ways to condense that that will come up but i'm, I'm just speaking very gesturally that 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 seems to be the thing about animation you want animation to be something that you've created, but you don't necessarily want like a hundred people to be necessary to make the thing. Sure. Yeah, and I, you know, I like to touch upon it. I don't know that I, I would call. It, I think this is more of an industry trend, and, I, and it's in a trend uh, that uh, it's due to the situation that we're that we're all in right now, uh, being the pandemic. Uh, something that you mentioned, Hank, about you know the fact that we are moving towards a world where you know we're seeing uh, a lot of things heading straight into streaming, uh, streaming services, um, as opposed to theatrical releases. Um, so I'm interested to know from you guys if you are seeing uh, you know higher demand uh, on your side for uh, content that is created specifically for streaming as opposed to uh, you know theatrical uh, uh, releases. I, absolutely on our end. I mean, I think because of the multiple streaming platforms and and the the just huge appetite for content right now, uh, it's actually a really good time for animation in particular. And the fact that animation of the different kinds of filmmaking paradigms survived, you know, the COVID and remote work and all that better than most uh, has helped. You know, it, it's still not perfect. We're still missing things that we had when we were all in a room together, uh, but it survived it fairly well. And that coupled with that appetite for content in part because lots of people are sitting at home now uh, mm -hmm. is, is making a real boon in animated content, both series and uh, feature length. Yeah, I, I think, you know, for, for a studio like ours, we're not huge, uh, but we are using a lot more talent from both all over the country and all over the world because um, I think, you know, COVID has the, the nature of having everybody home and kind of decentralized from these large hubs of, you know, of workplaces is opening up opportunities for us to work with people that we wouldn't otherwise have, uh, you know, the either thought we could work with or thought we could, you know, kind of integrate into our workflow because, you know, we, it's, we're traditionally, it is that very kind of linear workflow Hank was talking about and that very, you know, kind of structured pods of, of, you know, uh, teams and all that, but being able to have people all over the world dial into your pipeline, um, you know, make, be, be kind of a seamless part of that. And a lot of the tools that we're using now just make that easier, which is great. Yeah, you know, I think um, for myself, I, I see that as well. You know, I'm working at Mount Up Studios, for example, is a fully remote uh, studio. So, you know, our team is spread all over the world. And I think that, you know, the, the tools that we that we have now at our disposal are uh, are enabling the, the, that sort of workflow and that the viability of running, you know, full productions and studios that way, uh, which is, I think, is one of the more exciting developments uh, of the last few years, right? Uh, it's, it's how much the technology has evolved. Um, you know, uh, I'm curious, uh, about, uh, you know, kind of what software, uh, you guys, uh, have found that have, has, have helped you, uh, you know, 
or have enabled you to 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 do that, right? To in this age of the pandemic, um, you know, having to to work with your artists that are uh, at home uh, and not being able to to kind of come into the studio, you know, what kind of what sort of tools are you guys using uh, to enable those workflows? I mean, I could just, if you don't mind guys, jump, I jump in is, um, well, for, for communication, obviously Teams has been like number one for us at the mill um, and to, uh, you know, work within this, you know, in parallel with everyone else has been F-Track. So it's been, in, in, you know, essential for us to get this stuff done because we have so many studios and we're all over the world that, you know, we're in New York. So mainly we get to work with almost all the offices that we have. So Bangalore, from Bangalore to the side and then LA, London um, and Chicago. So uh, having F-Track to, you know, have uh, files being sent over is essential. And again, and using, uh, you know, teams to, to, to chat with everybody. And to be honest with you, I, 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 even though the pandemic has been horrible on all of us, I think one thing that has opened up is the, the new way for us to work. Uh, before I would say we didn't talk as much and now we're constantly chatting. And I find it, you know, better for us as a company and better for me as an artist because I can chat with anyone that I that that I can that, that I have a question for a friend of mine that's in India. I can call him and he can answer and I can have a face to face conversation. And I love that. If I have if everyone's sleeping in London, I can go and call LA and be like, hey, you know, do you know where this is at? So I feel like I'm always connected um, and I'm able to you know get my stuff done and do more iterations to get a, a better output. I would say thing for us and I think for our whole industry is there used to be physical constraints on a lot of things. It's, it's weird how jumping to these new technologies to address the challenges of COVID and remote work have turned into some interesting kind of new opportunities or, or new communication methods. Uh, instead of two people bumping into each other in a hall and having a conversation, a lot of times that's happening in a chat room now and other people are hearing the information at the same time. So it's actually helping with information spread in some regards, uh, instead of meeting rooms being deliberately constrained because of physical size and things like that, you can actually throw in an, you know, an information sharing meeting, things like that. And you can have 40 attendees or for that matter, review sessions. Review yeah. sessions used to be physically constrained by the room that you were holding the reviews in. Now you can, you can have you know, the same 20 people that are interacting with the director or whatever, but you can have another 80 people listening in. So they're hearing firsthand what the director's thoughts are and where his head's going with the, with the story being told in such a way that, that that information gets back to them for the shots they're working on, even if their shots aren't necessarily in the review that day. Uh, there's a lot of that kind of stuff now that the lack of physical uh, constraints is actually improving communication, which I don't think any of us foresaw. I think it was a mad mm -hmm. scramble across the industry. It's like, okay, we got to all work from home. How are we going to do that? And, you know, with a few bumps and bruises along the way, I think most of the companies landed in similar methodologies, uh, different in the details perhaps. But now we're start now that we've been doing it for a while, we're starting to see these potential upsides. Yeah. We, um, we actually initially, as I was saying, we, we had everybody working on site so that we could get the fastest turnaround on any revisions, any sort of last minute stuff. So the mandate was you have to work in the studio. And that meant that we couldn't work with various artists that were like, hey, I'm available, I'm in LA. And we're like, mm, sorry. But being having everything turned suddenly inside out was horrifying, but it did kind of reshuffle the deck. So now we were forced to work with people working mm -hmm. remotely. So now it's like, LA, sure, sign them up. The, our problem is just the networking to keep everybody connected. Um, and it's funny because Hank was mentioning how, you know, there's times when you want to make comments on one person's what, uh, review, one thing when it actually, actually affects other people who are doing something similar. And we've always had that problem. And we've always been like, no, spread the word that this is supposed to be green. But now we can, we have, and our Slack is our, our common way of communicating with everybody. We have more Slack channels that people are doing that sort of cross-pollination, making sure everybody can get the information that they need to. Um, we, Slack's the big one for us. Um, and, then let's see, and Zoom, Zoom is, is the other one. Um, 
And then the rest of it was just networking difficulties, working out that kind of thing, and just making sure everybody's internet connections were as good as they could be. Um, so there has been, so yeah, I agree. This is a, a blessing and a curse at the same time. This sort of, because we had a tremendous network in house and then we had to reset everything up outside. But bit by bit, we're working out that whole sort of like, how do you keep people connected when they're this far apart? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, we were using Slack. We just not too long ago started using Discord because of some of the kind of chat room mm -hmm. functionality in there. Um, we use Frankie for reviews with our clients, with you know agencies, with brands, with uh, uh, TV show folks. Um, and yeah, it does feel like you know the in the face of this challenge, we've made, we've kind of figured out, you know, some are new and some are old ways of communicating, but certainly even just using video we weren't all using video nearly as much as we do now, you know, a year ago. And uh, having uh, even just normal conversations with people, you know, whether they're clients or, or colleagues or whatever, it feels like video is kind of like the de facto now, which is great. I think that's just, you, you have a lot more of the nuances that you would otherwise have in a, you know, a per in-person conversation, which I do miss. I miss, I miss those, you know, walking in the hall hallways and bumping into somebody and having those kind of spur of the moment conversations that often do, you know, you, you feel, you have to feel a lot more intentional about it now and say, mm -hmm. Hey, jump into, you know, a discord chat with me or on Slack or let, you know, one of the 12 different ways that we can communicate. So it's, um, but I, I, I do, I feel optimistic about it. And I think it is exciting that we'll be able to get back to more of the in-person while also hopefully kind of holding on to a lot of the things that we've learned and improved in terms of our workflows and the tools that we use to make all communications easy, even if we're, you know, two offices away from each other. So, yeah. Definitely. Uh, Jeff, I think we might've lost you there for, for a second, um, but I, I'm interested in getting your take on this as well regarding, you know, how has your studio adapted to, uh, you know, working in the, the age of the pandemic, uh, you know, and, and kind of what tools are you using um, to make the communication work? I think I mentioned a little bit, but in the, I would say, no lie, the beginning was definitely, uh, was, was not that great. Um, because you have like 250 employees overnight, you have to go video. It, it was, it was, it was hard. But it took like a good, like maybe a couple of weeks to get everyone on par with how we were communicating before we were using VPN. And then, you know, imagine 250 people trying to go in there. It was not really working. We were being dropped. But then we ended up doing uh, uh, Zero Climb 1 of Terra Dicis. So yep. then we all were able to get one at, at home. So I have one at home. Uh, and if worse comes to worse, if whatever the, the Terra Dicis doesn't work, we can VPN now. And since everyone is a little bit of... Uh, either or the communication and the actual coming into work and, and going through the files are, is, is, is fine. So right now it is not even, um, there's not an issue with communicating and getting files from work. Um, I mean, sometimes, I mean, like a couple of weeks ago, there was a, somebody blew some sort of cable in Brooklyn, they cut it and it disrupted our, our servers for like a couple of hours. But that's just, you know, normal stuff, I guess, at this point. <laughs> but it's been adapting fine. You know, again, Teams is always uh, is a great thing to talk. And, and, um, um, and I'll just bring up the point that now you're, I feel that sometimes you end up working longer hours because you're always connected. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we try to make it very possible for us to chat on Fridays. We do, we leave it, you know, after work, we do a whiskey hour. So we all get together on Fridays and just have a casual conversation, just like we used to do it on Fridays. We used to hang mm -hmm. out at the roof deck and hang out and talk and what shows did you watch last night? What You know, just to have a more of a, I don't know, normality, you know, yeah. instead of just you, you, do, you have a conversation with someone, you're talking about work. And I don't I don't like to do that. I like to have some sort of a social interaction and we talk about anything. It doesn't matter. So, um, again, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Oh, beer, beer clock, very popular uh, at our studio as well. 
Um, you need you need those breaks, I think. And you're absolutely right. I think in, in this age now, you know, working from home, it's it's hard to disconnect. It's hard to stop, you know, thinking when when your your workstation is right there all the time, you know, you can just jump in. So we actually had a, a really great webinar last year. I think it was in November. We hosted a webinar all about that, uh, just kind of the, the age of COVID and how it's affected production. Uh, we're talking about the effects and there's some great insights there too. Uh, but so, you know, do you guys find that it's easier or harder now to to create content, you know, in the in the age of remote work? Or is it the same? <laughs> Roland, I think you're talking about your uh, yeah, right? yeah, sorry. Uh, different. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's it's we're still we're still producing, you know, I think the same general amount of work, but um, we're, we've just figured out different ways of, of getting it done. Um, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, having a physical office now. I mean, we've been paying rent for an office that's just sitting there and basically housing our servers and, you know, just kind of holding our stuff. Um, but like I said, you know, we've, uh, I, we did that motion capture shoot. That was the last time I'd been at the studio for any significant amount of time for like, you know, nine months. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's changed it, but I mean, in the end, I think we're all, we figured out how to make, make it work and be productive. It's just different. Sure. I think there's been a change with uh, some of the clients where sometimes we, we, you know, since we're there in, you know, the mill is very creative in terms of with uh, talking to with the mill plus directors, we advise clients like, hey, listen, I know you like to do shoots, but look at what we can do with CG. And we, you know, some of them have been like, oh, I like that. So we ended up doing a, now a fully CG uh, commercials now where clients were never thought about doing that. You know, there are some soft drink companies that just, they don't like to do CG because it, it, it doesn't, it's not their product. Their product is, you know, this is the real product and it needs to be real. But when you show them, that, you know, it, it actually looks real, they'll change their minds and they will do a completely CG. So that that has changed with some, um, 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 you know, companies that, that are changing their content. Definitely. I think for us, it's a little, it's a little harder, um, but it's because we are, somewhat vulnerable to people's local internet speeds, connectivity, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So periodically we'll hear that somebody just lost internet access for an hour and nobody knows why. And it's, so it's opened up more variables that we used to be able to control. Maybe that's, maybe that's just generally what it's done is create more opportunity for micro issues that um, can become significant. But the, if, it's, if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for making sure that everybody had the proper connection and all that, I think it's about the same because we're able to, like even when we're on site with like a hundred people, we still had to be slacking people. Here's the latest design, what do you think? So like there was still a lot of that stuff that was done remotely on site and now it's just remotely for real. And so a lot of it's, a lot of it's the same. I'd say ours is similar. It's, you know, there's there's some good and some bad and mostly it's, you know, landing about the same. Uh, early on, I think across the industry, there were challenges because people suddenly were at home with their kids. And, you know, there were all kinds of additional things the pandemic was foisting on all of us that complicated our lives. But over time, people have adapted and worked out schedules and regimens and um, you know, productivity is pretty solid. We're getting a lot of work done despite being remote. Definitely. No, that's, so that's, you know, that's good to hear that, that regardless of everything else going on, that the, the, the volume of work has remained steady, uh, you know, across the board. Um, so I did have more questions, but I think that the wisest thing to do right now is to move on to the Q&A because we have gotten quite a few questions, which is super exciting from the audience. Uh, it's always great when we have uh, an engaged audience that is participating. So um, we've uh, we've come through these questions uh, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll ask the question. Whoever has you know a good answer, just go ahead and jump in. Um, the first question that I got here uh, asks, uh, do you expect technology 
to allow multiple artists working concurrently on the same tasks to arrive? And if so, is it something we should plan for? I mean, I, I touched on that just a tiny bit. I, I think it's a huge deal. Uh, I think in the coming years, we're gonna get more and more down that path. Uh, as I've mentioned, you know, in a number of my answers, the anything that can make it so that the director and the story team can turn the crank one more time is a win. And that's usually going to mean compressed asset production and shop production schedules. And so anytime you can embrace a parallel workflow, it's a win. In the ideal abstract, you'd have this notion of the layout artist is blocking out the given shot and talking about cameras with the director at the same time the animator starting to do their blocking on the performance so that they can get something in front of the director. Your cloth and hair sim folks are starting to explore with that animation. What's that looking like? Your effects artists are starting to place environmental effects in the scene and your lighter is already blocking in the lighting all at the same time. You know, and I think the tools and technologies are getting there to enable that type of workflow. There's all kinds of extra questions to ask and answer about uh, how do you communicate? You know, how to, it, you know, an asset artist is still working on the ground plane, but can an animator start blocking in their animation if they know that, that, that the part of the ground plane they're working on is for a different part of the sequence and isn't going to affect their footfalls? You know, things like that. How do you communicate that between the artists? I think it's going to be one of the fun challenges in arriving at that, but in the abstract, that's absolutely where you want to get to. You want to get to where you can parallel, you can make as much of the shot production process parallel as possible uh, so that you can collapse the number of calendar weeks that it takes to do shot production in order to get one or two more turns of the crank on the story side. Definitely. Uh, anybody else want to add anything to that? I mean, I'll reiterate the same thing what Hank was saying. If with us at the mill, we try to, because we know that at the end of the day, if, if, if the director or clients, whoever, they try to keep uh, keening on modeling and making sure that it looks exactly what they want, it eats away on the whole line scope that you have to finish it. So then the poor lighters effects renders only have a small ch chunk of the, of the whole scope of the, the length of it. So when we get the modeling done, we usually do the rig really quick. So then that way the animators have something like if the model gets approved one day, you can get a rig within another couple hours or another day so the animator can start the next day. And, and then we can still work in parallel with the rig and the animation. So it happens at the same time. And once the animators have something that looks okay, just like it goes from A to B, we export it out. And like Hank was saying, you have effects can do cloth, uh, particles can get done right away on top of it and is you know working with the f-track it'll just update automatically and but you have a pipeline going so that, that way the lighters have more more chances to make it look better and better and better and the lighters love it at the end of the day yeah absolutely um so next question that I have here is, uh, we've recently seen technological advances that make it much easier to render fur and skin on creatures and simple scenes in high resolution. Uh, do you think the ease of this tech will result in more animated films coming out soon because they are easier to make? This person seems to be narrowing here kind of on, on one aspect, but do you think that the advances in tech will allow for, um, for more animated films to be, uh, to be made because of the ease of, uh, of production. Uh, having been doing this uh, for 26 years now, production hasn't gotten any easier. Uh, the, the absolutely new technologies are coming along all the time that are uh, really exciting and are absolutely enabling you to do the thing you did five years ago way easier than when you did it five years ago. But the thing you're being asked to do is always, at least has been my experience, is always going to push up against the boundaries of that. You're always being asked to do new things in the number of characters that's seen, the complexity of the environments. Who, I mean, we talked earlier, uh, exploring NPR looks and things like that. Uh, you're always pushing for new capabilities and pushing up against the boundaries of what you can do. Uh, those new technologies are great. You know, they, they enable one more turn of the crank or two more turns of the crank for a given artist in a given department. But then you consume that by reaching for a higher bar. I think the, at the same time, what maybe not more movies, but definitely certain types of movies or looks that we, that would have just been 
not feasible to produce before now we can actually have you know we can we can try uh, we have the tools to do it but as hank said it doesn't make it any easier because those are still really challenging asks um with all the technology that we have access to so but it at least it, it opens up the possibility for it which is exciting yeah anybody else Cool. So uh, one thing, uh, the next next question here is one thing I've noticed that several studios I've worked with is that the technical people uh, dominate the animator's workflow to the extent that they spend upwards of two to three hours per day engaging that pipeline rather than actually animating. How are studios working to reduce this potential time and quality hit? I have two sides of an answer to that one. Uh, <laughs> There is always going to be some component of the artistic process that is about the larger picture. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you're a layout artist or an animator or a lighter, there is certain facets to your job that are in service of creating that whole thing. Because at the end of the day, the what we do is collaborative art. We have a team of 200 people that are all working together across all these different disciplines to craft a singular piece of art together. Uh, many, many times over the years, I've gotten engaged in conversations with people. Why do I have to jump through all these hoops? I just want to do X, whatever their piece of that is. And it's like, yeah, but your piece is in service of that whole thing. And there, those steps are to enable other people to do their jobs. Uh, you're, you're, you're crafting a piece of that thing and delivering to others who, who need it to be a certain way or need it to do certain things. Uh, that said, sure, absolutely. You're always looking for ways to improve the methodology of communication, improve the way you're doing those handoffs. Because absolutely, you want in the ideal for the, your artists to spend most of their time creating art and as little of their time as possible in the technical hoops that they have to jump through to enable others to use the results of their art. Uh, so, I, I guess that's kind of a non-answer because it is both. I <laughs> yeah. mean, there is always going to be some component of that because your art is not the art. Your art is a piece of the final product. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be some component that is contributing to that whole and isn't necessarily the crafting of the perfect camera move or a performance or the perfect light glint. You know, the, those are facets of it. Uh, but yeah, technology in general exists to do two things. It exists to make you better at the thing you could already do, or exists, as was just touched on in the previous one, exists to enable you to do a thing you couldn't do before. And so improving those handoffs is absolutely part of technology's job. Amen to that. I mean... <laughs> I, I, I um, with when we do the commercials, I mean, the longest we probably can go is maybe 60, 90 seconds. We don't have to do an hour or so for animated features, but is the, I think the same premise is the same where, you know, like the animator would say, but I just want to move this thing and I can't do it or it's just, it's too slow. And then, you know, we definitely tried our best to create rigs that are in different uh, uh, LODs. We can go from like uh, to block it then we do a medium res and a high res. And hopefully they'll get the thing with running at 30 frames per second to get their animation workflow and get, you know, their many iterations on it. But then, you know, you know, I think you need adaptability as an animator doing commercials, they need to adapt to, to you, know, um, you know, to what's in front of them. So as long as, again, and, and, I, and, I, and I synthesize with them because I, I used to be an animator too. So I want my rig to be able to move at 30 frames per second, please. And, and if that if they can do that, then I'm a happy person. Um, and then you know you need to adapt if if the next version when you go to high res, you need to fix some um, um, you know penetrations, and you have to go there and be you know mindful. You have to you know play blast it and see it, or then you fix it again. But you know we we are only doing that scope of it, which is whatever thirty to ninety seconds. Yeah, I think I think it's too about you know expectations, right? You know, I think that is a it's a good thing to know for for animators that are entering the uh, industry. Or I think artists in general, really, that there will always be that component, right? You know, of your of your job that is going to be you know working with the tech artists and the pipeline TDs and you know and focusing on those you know uh, 
you know, pipeline aspects that, that are just part of your job, because like, like, like you guys have said, it is just, just part of the, you know, part of the job. I mean, you're working on uh, in service to a bigger product, to a bigger thing that you're contributing to. So a good, a good tip that I, that I think I've seen a few junior artists uh, kind of realized once they were already doing the, the job is that that will always be, you know, there will be some component to that. Uh, that will be part of, uh, of your every day. Um, uh, next up here, uh, let's see. Um, 3D animation, uh, says this question, seems to always be targeting uh, a very uh, young audience. 2D animation doesn't seem to be constrained in the same way. Why is this and will it ever change? I, I, I was waiting for this one. I read this one. <laughs> uh, there's a famous Walt Disney quote that said, I don't make movies for children. I make movies for children aged eight to 80. And uh, I think that mentality is certainly what drives a lot of the high end uh, 3D animated films. I, I would disagree with that base premise that the CG animated films are aimed at children, having worked on a number of them and supervised them over the years. I, I, I do take a mild, a bit of offense at that, but we, we deliberately make them for the broadest audience possible. And a big chunk of that is just because of the budget of those projects. When you're aiming uh, for mainstream acceptance, you're aiming for the broadest audience in part because you're making a film that costs, you know, $150 million, $200 million, whatever that budget ends up being, you have to get a return on investment of that. You have to get a movie that, you know, will make half a billion dollars to a billion dollars box office. You just have to. And so you want to strike the broadest audience as possible. And that includes parents bringing their kids. It includes date night for high school and college age people. It includes, you know, adults of all ages and or children of all ages. Uh, that is the biggest factor in why that comes across that way, I think, is you're trying to hit a broad audience with those kind of, of projects because of the cost of those projects. 2D in some regards, you can, you can find absolutely these 2D projects that are these kind of aimed at particular niches. You know, They're telling smaller scale stories or targeted to a particular audience in part because they're doing them at a much larger or a much smaller price point. And so they can, they can target that because they don't need that kind of return on investment. Uh, I think CG is heading that same direction. And I think we're starting to see pieces of that. I think things like uh, Love, Sex, Robots, things like that, we're seeing a lot of instances where CG is being used in, the, in a similar way. The cost of generating CG content has come, has come down in and of itself, except for when you're aiming for that really huge scope and scale kind of stuff. And when you can deliver things at a lower price point, it enables you to tell uh, stories that don't have to strike a really broad audience. You can tell stories to a particular audience. So anyway, that's my three and a half cents on that. I think, you know, culturally, there's also a big part of it because at least in the US, as opposed to Japan or Europe, um, you have a culture where cartoons are thought of more specifically for younger audience or for families than, you know, your more kind of broad either, you know, big uh, visual effects action movies or even a lot of the games that people are playing these days, which are getting, you know, as we talked about earlier, closer and closer to looking like the quality that we're doing in, you know, in our films and shows and, and commercials. But um, yeah, I think it is, that there's a certainly a cultural aspect of that here that tends to kind of pigeonhole animation, particularly CG animation, but animation in general to a younger or family friendly audience. Bruce, I'm interested in your take on this, uh, being that you're working currently in, uh, in the late night cartoons. Yeah, um, it's interesting. And I, I think Hank had an interesting point. Um, and I, my gut feeling is he's probably right. There is there is that sense that CG tends to be more, I would say broad or family friendly might be the way to put it as opposed to targeted for a younger audience. Um, the whole idea of 2D being potentially less expensive and therefore you could target an audience that I haven't really thought of it that way because I just sort of, you know, take it for what it is. I mostly work in 2D, so it was never really an issue. But I think that 
I think that might explain it. Um, and the the one show that I did, one series I did work that was CG was youngish. Um, but I, frankly, our cartoon present is the first one where they could actually swear and then it would actually be broadcast that way. So like all of a sudden I've gone from, you know, basically for 10 year olds to not appropriate for anybody under, you know, voting age basically. So, um, but I think that's, I think that might be a good point about the broadness that's necessary and therefore uh, not, not quite as niche. I, mean, I would add just as a side effect of the earlier conversation we had about more of the move towards streaming, you know, we talked about it then that it, that in and of itself is lowering the price point for the content. You know, you're going to be delivering content at a lower price point and a lower return, mm -hmm. but that also means you're delivering content more targeted. You're delivering content to target different kinds of audiences um, rather than trying to target, you know, a global broad audience. Definitely. Um, yeah, those are, I think those are great answers. Uh, and I 100% and agree with you, Hank, on this. Uh, uh, next up here, uh, does everyone, does everyone remote into the studio or work in the cloud? If so, have you had to send systems out to remote workers? So this is talking about, obviously, how you approach having your, your staff at home. I know that for us in Mountaintop Studios, we do send out uh, uh, stations or, or uh, desktop PCs out to everybody and all the equipment that they need and they work remote. Um, but I'm interested to hear from you guys, what are your, your setups like over yeah, at I your could, studios? I could definitely speak to that. Um, we, <laughs> when I think this was, um, it was March 13th, it was a Friday uh, last year, HR brought everybody, uh, talked to everybody, said basically you, you can't be on site anymore. So um, you have to, it, it's that thing, uh, you know, it's like closing time. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. So uh, everybody, we basically had everybody grab their workstation as best they could. Some people had to come back in later, pick things up. Basically, we had most of the 100 person crew bring home their iMacs and um, they would set up at home and or if they didn't want to use what they had in in house, then uh, they would use whatever they had at home. And the, we did not want to be shipping on mass all of this equipment out to people. So it was kind of like either come you know pick up what you had here because we know that's going to work for the show, or give us your specs. So we had to reach out to everybody saying like what equipment are you going to use? What is your internet speed? Like all of those things. This big inventory of hardware, software, all that, um, so that we didn't have to be constantly shipping things out to people. And then because VPN was way too slow for sending large files, uh, we had to, we quickly went to Google Drive and then bounced on to um, AWS, uh, Amazon's uh, cloud. So mm -hmm. we, we could not get to the server reliably enough. So it had to be the cloud and then we back up to the server periodically. It's part of the whole IT process. But for us, it was everybody grab your equipment or work with what you have at home um, and then save to the cloud or work to the cloud. I mean, I think that a lot of the industry is has similar stories. You know, it was, it was a bit of a mad panic uh, to suddenly shift to working from home uh, yeah. and a lot of sending, sending workstations, laptops, whatever, home with people or sending thin clients or whatever, whatever form that took uh, so that they could connect back to, the, to their machines and the network and all of that. I think migrating storage and compute and desktops to the cloud is something that's appealing to a lot of folks in the industry, but it, in the middle of that mad panic wasn't the right time to go, hey, you know what? we should explore this whole new technology we haven't gotten a good handle on. Uh, it was just, how do we how do we stay working? And so I think most of the industry migrated to people logging into their workstations that already existed in the network that already existed. And then cloud exploration, I think as Bruce was touching on, came later. People started going, hey, as long as we're doing this, we should start poking at that more. 
Um, I think luckily for us at the mill, we were, like I mentioned before, we all like, when they told us to leave, we, we just basically everyone took off with, so to try to, to try to log in as VPN. And then a week later, we're like, well, we can log into VPN. So we all, we all had to drive back into the city to grab our monitor. I took my monitor, I took my chair, uh, I took, you know, my, the Teradici, the zero client, I took it home. And then after that it was great. Luckily, um, all our machines are, are located at a, on another building that is being maintained with the AC. So our systems people don't, don't have to literally go to the, the machine rooms. Um, and we also use the cloud computing. So if we need to, we need extra machines to render, we just send it to the, to the cloud and we, we render from there. So at that end, it was kind of a pretty good, easy transition. Again, it was a little bit rough in the beginning, but after that, we, we learned from those things and we got better at it. So nobody is actually at the office right now. Um, I think maybe, I don't know, maybe three people out of the whole building, mm. you know, that's about it. Yeah, a similar experience in terms of using the zero clients. We, you know, at first we were just doing screen sharing and that didn't really work, you know, smoothly enough. And then, and then uh, the zero clients really helped quite a lot. And, you know, it helped with our, our existing core crew, but also, making it a lot easier to have a solution to send to new artists that we were gonna work with, regardless of where they might be and have the confidence that they're gonna be dialing into a machine that already has the software set up, that's on our network, that you know has all the security, that has access to the render farm and all of that, making it a lot easier to feel like we could onboard somebody quickly and have that still have that flexibility. So I think that that has been a positive thing um, and we, we only got there because of that need of having to go to have everybody remote um, via thin clients. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's definitely, I think, been a challenge for everybody, but uh, it's also been just surprising to see how quickly the industry has adapted and, you know, and, and has been able to just kind of keep functioning uh, even through that, that rough patch at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so guys, uh, that is it. Uh, we did have more questions and I, and I do apologize if we did not get to your question, but it is, uh, we're now four, four minutes past the time that we were supposed to end the webinar and these guys are busy. Um, so I, I want to thank you all, uh, for, for joining, uh, uh and I want to give a huge thanks uh, to our, our speakers today. Um, uh, you know, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for participating in this webinar and answering all of my questions and the audience's questions. It's been a real pleasure to get to talk to you guys today. Um, so thank you, uh, to everybody in the audience as well for, for attending. I hope you all got as much out of this as I did. Uh, it was a super interesting discussion today. Um, uh, we are going to be running a, uh, a feature release webinar for F Truck Review, where you can see all the newest updates and features being added pretty soon. Uh, if you would like to learn about more webinars that are coming up, you can head over to ftrack.com uh, forward slash webinars, where you can see what's on next and download previous webinars as well. Uh, our discussion today will be on there soon. Uh, if you would like to download it and check it out, uh, we'll send you a link once that is ready. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, sales related or otherwise, uh, please do get in touch with F-Track's head of sales, America's Brian. Um, Brian is awesome. He's gonna be able to help you out if you have any questions uh, about the software or how, uh, how it works. Um, and then we'll send you a post webinar questionnaire after the webinar ends. Um, so if, uh, if you have some time, we would love to hear, uh, you know, from you about how we can improve these webinars in the future and make them more beneficial, uh, to you all. So once again, thank you everybody, uh, for attending. Thank you so much to our awesome speakers today. You guys were delightful. Uh, thanks for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Uh, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Thank you guys. Thanks, Ray. Thanks everybody. Bye, everybody.